All right. So, uh, hi, Luigi. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm good, fine on you. Good. I'm good. I'm good. Excellent. It's hot here, so uh, please excuse my attire or lack or lack of it. Yeah. Anyways, here is so, hot also. Is it okay? Yeah. I mean, tropical people tropical of the world tonight. Exactly. So, um, you know, the point today is that uh, we want to talk about uh, basically how do we quantize things, um, you know, operators in MQG or quantizing geometry in LKG, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, okay, so let's look at, for instance, let's begin by looking at uh, what are the states? How do we define states in a loop on gravity? So the state space, and keep in mind that this is the kinematic state space, Mm -hmm. Okay, which means basically kinematic uh, state space means it's the it's the like the configuration space of the theory. So, yeah. if if you want to um, you know uh, do a time evolution, we'll have to do something different. But uh, uh, you know what we get when we do a time evolution are these objects called spin forms. So the state space consists of these objects, which are called spin networks. Okay. And I'm not going to go through the whole procedure of how we get there, right? I'll just very briefly mention mm -hmm. what happens. Right. We start with the Einstein Hilbert action as a function of the metric and the connection, right? In the first order formalism. Then we transform to uh, a function of uh, tetrads on the, the spin connection, tetrads and right and the uh, well, it's spin connection some, first, isn't it? Spin connection, that, and then you uh, and then later well, you transform to Ashtekar connection. Right, right. So the Ashtika connection is normally written as A. So that's why I was using that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what. That's why I was talking. Like, I mean, we'll take the K and then we'll do a canonical transformation, right? Yep. So, uh, uh, no. Okay. Uh, sorry. I'm. I, I, sh I should. It's 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 the four dimensional bulk. Uh, Bow it's a four dimensional SL, SL2C connection, right? Yep. Right. And so once we once we have this, right, then we uh, can do the three plus one. I mean, you can do the three plus one here also, mm -hmm. right? And obtain the uh, this thing, the momentum. Uh, constraint plus the Hamiltonian constraint. constraint. So this is what the total. Right? This is the total Hamiltonian. Right? Yes, which vanishes weakly. Um, well, it vanishes. I mean, yeah, it vanishes weakly. Uh, I mean, it is equal to it zero, but but the Poisson bracket of but some. If you Poisson bracket it, it with something, you generate a canonical transformation. It's zero, okay. but the can, but the Poisson brackets are with something. It's not it's not necessarily zero. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of technical issues with that, so I don't want to go into that. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, you're right. You're right. It's it's important to keep this in. So this is basically the generator of spatial diffeomorphisms. Right? And this mm -hmm. is the generator of uh, time-like diffeomorphisms or time evolution. 
right? And we can do the same thing in uh, over here, and we get again a gr. But now we get three terms, right? Plus h Hamiltonian. Uh, so and before doing this three plus one, we uh, no after doing the three plus one. Uh, what is it? Well, one can do it either before or after. It doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in between, there is a basically a transformation to the Astrica variable. So I'll just call it Astrica transformation. So now we have we have three constraints, right? Mm -hmm. And again, here uh, in the metric case, our phase space. We have these foliations. So each foliation has an internal metric and it has uh, an extrinsic curvature associated with it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the face the face space is uh, uh, this PAB is a function of the extrinsic curvature. Mm -hmm. It looks like something like it it was okay. one over square root of the tetra of the triads times the extrinsic curvature contravariance minus the trace of the curvature times the, the tree metric. Right. I mean it looks something like this. Yeah, it was something like that. Right. Okay. So these are the phase space variables, right? And here, so again we have the diffeomorphism time evolution, and now this is the new one. This is the Gauss constraint. A Gauss constraint, yeah. And you need that because now you have the redundancy in the in the local frame. Yes. Due to the fact that you, we are using tetrads. And uh, uh, so, and, and what is the phase space here? I mean, it's a uh, uh, it's a three dimensional tetrad, and uh, and uh, what do you call it? Omega, I guess. Yeah. And a uh, and a spin connection. And now this is a SO three. Uh, it's a connection. It's a SO three bundle. Mm -hmm. Right, and this this is a triad. Okay, so now uh, we can ask how to construct operators. Right, if you want to construct a quantum theory, right. So, in this case, in you know, one would define states to be functionals of let's say the configuration variable right mm -hmm. and similarly here okay and and then operators for instance would be something let's say something roughly speaking like this maybe mm. and and then the that's momentum the eigenvalue equation no no. I mean, because, you know, I'm just saying that, you know, if you're working in like the position representation, so to speak, yeah. then the position operator just gives you the position eigenvalue. Yeah. Right. And then similarly, this would be something like IH bar. Derivative with respect to metric. Right. Okay. Okay. So now the thing is that one could have gone the same route in in the Astrika case, but here we choose a different, we choose a different route and we are able to choose that route because we can define these gauge invariant uh, variables or function, you know, probes of the geometry, right? Mm. 
and one of one of them is simply the holonomy of this connection around it, across through any two points mm -hmm. or around a closed loop exactly yeah, yeah. so it's the trace of the path ordered integral of uh this gauge connection and here i can only i don't need two indices so i'll just keep one index okay and this is mm -hmm. what we know i mean and love right from yes. electromagnetism that's all it is yes so Right, and the thing about these variables is that um, you know they automatically uh, are well. Oops, I shouldn't say trace over here. Uh, yeah, no, no, this is fine. Yeah, trace. So it's a trace, right? And since it's a trace of uh, this group element, it's it's invariant under rotation. Okay? Yeah. Okay. And now the thing is that if you make this choice, the moment we make this choice, mm. right? So coming back to the uh, canonical case, see these functionals are objects which are defined on the entire uh, um, on the entire foliation. Yeah. So basically, they they have. Uh, you know, technically speaking, their support is R3. Right? But this, these functions are on, are supported on R1, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem arises in the canonical case because when you have operators which are supported on R3, like, again, I'm using very um, sort of indicative note, you know, I mean, it's not very precise mathematically, but the point is that it has support on R3. Then what happens is that products of all of these operators, for instance, have support on R6 and so on. And so this leads to all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. Right? So because you have to integrate something over the manifold once and then integrate over the same manifold twice. So you have six, you know. But in this case, we have chosen these uh, holonomy variables. And see, if we choose these holonomy variables, then we can make a choice of uh, a second set of variables, which has support on R2. Mm. Right. And so then what will happen is, so for instance, in this case, if you want to construct the Poisson brackets of these of these objects, right? This is something um, uh, you know, which which has support on on R six. But if you if you take and and so what are these quantities which are support on R2? I'll just call them fluxes, phi, S. And since they have support on R2, if you if you construct the Poisson bracket of these of these objects, they will have support on R3. Hmm. Right. So already the this picture allows us with allows us greater control on what's going on. So now, what is what is this uh, this flux variable? Uh, let me just refer back to my notes. Uh, so one second. Mm. So the, these flux variables are constructed from these triads, okay? And mm -hmm. they look like this, EI wedge, 
well i guess you don't need uh, you can yeah if, if you're, you're gonna wedge product, you, you right? don't refer yeah. to the space time index right so this is this is pih basically mm -hmm. and this is our this is our and and our flux is obtained uh, by integrating this pij over a path over an area okay yeah it makes sense right right so this is the area element of the surface s oh you you integrating group space no this is not no no this is not in group well no, this the, is not the, in the, the, those are hmm? group indices ij aren't they Oh right, you're 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 right, you're right. So I mean, <laughs> uh, then uh, in that case, how yeah, do I, I think how you, do I, I, I think what you mean is, I think what you mean you is not dxi the wedge dxj because the 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 differential forms are already in the definition of the p. So you just integrate the p con and you contract the internal indices with uh, Levis right. theta maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So thanks. Thanks for pointing out that even though I'm not saying things correctly, I'm probably not on the wrong track. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're completely right. It's a two form, so I can integrate it over uh over any area. two surface. And that that's what we do and we get uh, the area element. Okay. Okay. So this is our, our our flux operator, right? And now we can uh using this. Uh, so, so what is the relationship for of of these spin network objects that I mentioned earlier? Right? Mm. What are these spin networks? How do they come from this? So, are you familiar with something called the Peter Weil theorem? Uh, what theorem? <laughs> right. So let me go Peter... over Peter Peter Weil. Mm. Okay. It's it's. It's basically Fourier analysis is the theorem, uh, which so so you have like in Fourier analysis the fundamental theorem says that any functions you know which have certain uh, periodicity can be written mean, as sums of sines and cosines. Exactly right. Uh, so or basically that any function can be decomposed into a linear combination of uh, functions which are orthogonal with respect to some inner product, right? Yes. It's a state statement that, that you know, L, L2 functions, square integrable functions form a vector space under a suitable, uh, you know, uh, well, keeping, you know, all the mathematic, dotting all the mathematical I's and crossing all the mathematical keys. Mm -hmm. Right. So the Peter Weil theorem says the same thing, but for functions in a group, on a group manifold. So it's basically Fourier analysis on on groups, on group manifolds. Right. Okay. On Lie groups. Right. Well, yeah, because Lie groups, I mean, are the ones which have continuous manifolds, right, as a group space. Yep. Okay. So. Why do we need this? Well, the reason this comes in in use is because, uh, see, we have constructed these these objects, right? These holonomies, mm -hmm. right? And these these uh, holonomies are functions on the group space. Yes. Right. Uh, the these are uh, objects. Which which live on this thing um, on SU two. Uh, I have to see. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to define wave functions, once again, what do we do? We take wave functions in you know I mean the simplest prescription. We take them to be functionals of our configuration variables, which let's say we choose to be our holonomies. Mm -hmm. 
right? And then we want to, you know, be able to uh, perform this differentiation with respect to these momentum operators, right? So in ordinary, in usual quantum mechanics, what we do is uh, we transform to momentum space, right? In which case that that derivative becomes a becomes a product. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so it's basically the same idea. Is that you want to go to this is the uh, this is the quote unquote position space, and you want to be able to construct the momentum space representation of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And once you have the momentum space representation, then we will see that it becomes fairly straightforward to be able to find the action of these derivative operators on this momentum space. Mm -hmm. And that will bring us to the area operator. Mm -hmm. So if anything is not clear so far, let me know. No, it's fine. Okay. So now, uh, so let's, let me talk about the Peter Weil theorem, right? So if we have some, we have some group G and we have some element of this group, mm -hmm. right? Then we know from representation theory that, you know, this group can be written as a matrix, uh, which is a, you know, which is labeled by by some label J, right? Mm -hmm. J labels the representation, this, mm -hmm. right? And this matrix is, you, we write it like this, DJ. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is this is called the Wigner matrix, I think, or you know, whatever. It's just it, so this matrix, this object is, you know. The representation, the spin J representation of the group element G. Mm -hmm. So what we will see is that these spin labels, they become our momentum. Mm -hmm. Right. And which kind of makes sense because you know, if you if you think about momenta, that's kind of what you know uh, momenta do, right? They allow you to organize the your 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 states into uh, different energies, different energy levels, and well, we'll see that you know this is exactly the momentum. Okay, mm -hmm. so now there are a couple of uh, expressions which are useful. I mean, I could go straight and mention the Peter Weil theorem. But uh, let me just mention this something called the great orthogonality theorem. And you will see why it's important. Okay. So what this says is, let me write down the statement first. And I'm sort of moving the J indices around a little bit because of, you know. Convenience. Convenience, really, nothing else. Uh, okay. So what is this? What is this integral, right? Mm. And let me, my writing is also terrible. This integral is basically saying that we are taking the matrix elements for the same group element. Yes. Right, this is the matrix element. in the spin J rep mm -hmm. and but this integral is, same... is gonna be proportional to a bunch of deltas. Exactly. And this is in the spin J prime rep. Yeah. Right? And what is obviously not, it is not obvious that this will be proportional to deltas because you know, we are not summing over any of these M indices, M and N prime indices, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the somewhat like uh, 
non obvious aspect which is that the matrix elements themselves form an orthogonal basis for functions which are defined on the group mm -hmm. and this object as you might already know is called the har measure okay mm. I don't think I heard about Haar measure. Haar measure is simply the invariant measure on a group. Okay. And I'll I'll just very quickly tell you what it is because it's not that difficult to explain. Basically, let's say that you have some function on a group. And then you want to integrate this over the group manifold. Mm -hmm. So if you just, you know, so, so we'll need some measure for that on the group manifold, mu. Now, if you take this object, right? Mm. And you take all the group elements and displace them by some well, other right group element. Right displacement? H. Right displacement or left displacement, right? Either way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then... We, the, we require... the measure is going to be invariance. Exactly. Okay. It's like when you you define uh, what's its code, Lie, Lie algebras with left invariance of vector fields. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, this is actually like, you know, nothing more than saying that, for instance, if I define yeah, so I, I mean, if, if the algebras are the derivatives in the group, th this one, this is the integrals in the group. If I define okay. functions which are on the real line, right? Then my then my group is the group of translations. Yes. And, and then I want such integrals to be invariant under translations. Mm -hmm. So so this is the the statement, right? And so this is the, the Haar measure, okay? Okay. So when you integrate with respect to this Haar measure, these matrices uh, form an Are orthogonal. orthogonal. Basis, okay. Right? And uh, this statement right now, it's for, a, it's for a discrete group because you see NG is the order of the group, mm -hmm. right? The number of elements. So if you're talking about a Lie group, which obviously has an infinite number of elements, this becomes the volume of the group manifold. Okay. Okay. So it's 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 something that's that's well defined. It's not you know arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And n n j is the dimensionality of the jth representation. So n n j is just two uh, j plus one. Okay. Okay. So this is the statement that these matrix elements form a complete orthogonal basis of functions on the group, that's it. Mm -hmm. And since they form a complete orthogonal function, a basis, you can take any function on the group manifold and you can write it like this. But the sum mm -hmm. now is over the all the spins and over all the matrix elements. Okay. And, you know, we can find this by simply taking F of G, right? Multiplying by the, the Hermitian conjugates. Right? Integrating over the, so, over the group. Yeah. Yeah. And then we substitute this expression and then out of that, you know, yeah, we, the, we the coefficients are, the... Pro are proportional to that, right? There should be a proportionality constant somewhere. Where? Sorry? There should be a proportionality constant somewhere, right? It won't, it won't so, be equal to the integral. It will be proportional to the integral. Well, right now, I'm just defining this integral. I'm just writing down this integral. Okay. 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 So if I just, you know, just this integral... This, if I just substitute this expression, this sum J M M, mm 
g m n prime n prime uh and oops mm. this should be f of f, j m n yeah okay right f of j m n uh, or since that, i'm using m n, m n m n prime i should use m prime n prime uh, no, 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 no. No, sorry, it's yeah. without primes times uh, the, yeah, the yeah. D. Yeah. yeah, no, I know, I know. I'm just, I'm just rushing things. So let me not rush things. Let me write things slowly. Okay. Okay. Integral of f of j m n. Okay, that's times d of g n prime n prime in dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now okay. the J prime so should becomes... be downstairs for this workout, well, uh, right? Well, uh, no, I mean, you know, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, yeah, it's just uh, there, formality there for is each no... workout. Right, right. Right, right. I mean, it's there's no, um, yeah, right. There's no dual space there. It's, it's all the same space. So, yeah. So from this, you know, we can, and using the orthogonality relationship, right? What we will get is that F J M N is equal to, so we'll get a whole bunch of Delta functions. We'll contract them with the F J's. And on the left side, uh, uh, we are getting uh, the contraction of F with the, with these matrix elements. And so we can write down with all, you know, after doing a little bit of simplification and whatnot, mm -hmm. D mu J, F J. Couldn't we be a bit more careful about the placement of the measures since it's a group or it doesn't matter In because it's a, it's a group, right? So shouldn't the measure, no. oh, but it's right, a but scalar, no, right? No. No, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, not, you know, yeah nothing act, nothing, yeah, forget the nothing acts on it, right? So, this is this is the Peter Weil, you know, I mean, uh, a sort of well, Peter Weil theorem without some of the technical aspects. If you, you know, read a book on harmonic analysis, of course, there will be all sorts of other things mm -hmm. that will be taken care of, but this is the bottom line. Yeah. So now we can use this, right? And now what we do is, um, now we, well, we use this. How do we use this? We take these functions, these holonomies, right? And we take states of these holonomies, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, let me just one second. I have this all written down in a paper which has not been, which I have not put out yet, but it's all there in the appendix. I'll share that with you and. Mm -hmm. Just open that in the meantime. So, quantum states in general. Okay. All right. And uh, since this is uh, this, yeah. So let me actually just share the screen and show you. Uh, this because it's 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 uh, much much written up much much more cleaner than. Uh, okay. So this is from metric to connection variables, okay? Again, so we start mm. with Einstein-Hilbert, right? And uh, we write in terms of this thing, then we go to the connection variables. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the Einstein-Hilbert action can be written this way, right? Where F is the curvature of the spin connection. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can perform the three plus one split. So there's a slight, uh, change in difference in the variables here. I'm using capital E for the tetrads and uh, sorry, uh, capital E for the uh, triads and small e for the tetrads. So uh, apart from that, it's the same thing from what I've been writing down. And when we do the three plus one decomposition, we find that 
this is the action right this is p right uh, this is pq dot mm -hmm. uh, and these are the constraints and this is uh, what i was telling you earlier this is the uh, momentum conjugate to ace this is we integrate this over uh, surfaces mm -hmm. okay so now right okay now how do we construct uh, these the, what are these spin networks right so we have these these holonomies and again there is a typo here there should be a path order exponential mm -hmm. right so now the thing is that uh, what we are trying to do is we want to we are trying to construct these these states uh which uh, and and these states are probing the geometry of 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 our manifold right so if we only have one holonomy then the state is probing the geometry only along that one dimensional edge mm -hmm. right so you can construct a state which is a function of uh, many holonomies right and mm. where mm. each holonomy is defined along an independent edge a separate edge right these functions are called cylindrical functions so right now at this stage basically it's like you take a manifold and you mm. sprinkle it with one one dimensional holonomies okay mm -hmm. which may or may not be connected to each other in any way or not okay mm -hmm. now on these states one can define uh, an inner product this inner product just comes from the fact uh, that you have an inner product on uh, this group manifold mm -hmm. okay because so using this inner product the hilbert space for a single single graph uh, with with l edges becomes this mm. l is the number of edges so for each edge you have an su2 variable and you have the space of square integrable functions living on l copies of su2 mm -hmm. right so now we construct uh, again this is the peter weil theorem etc right what we just talked about and now we are going to go we are going to construct the quantum space quantum state space okay mm -hmm. so what is this representation matrix let's let's look at this again right so each matrix this matrix is 2j plus 1 times 2j plus 1 dimensional right that's mm -hmm. what mn and takes values in so you can think of each representation matrix as a map from the hilbert space of a spin j particle to itself Mm. right i mean because that's what it's that's what it's it's telling you right it's the group rotation corresponding to this group element right mm -hmm. and the j is okay. just telling you what is the dimensionality of the space on which it's acting yes right so so this this is a very you know there is no ambiguity about this statement i hope that that is okay at this point Mm -hmm. so each such matrix right you can also view it as an element of this tensor product space hj cross hj yes okay so this implies that the space l square g the, the space in which this function f of g lives can be decomposed as a direct sum over all possible representations of su2 mm right because f of g is a sum of yes, all possible your, your representations sum, here your sum over of all j's right so we can write l square j in this form right now even before going to that we can ask ourselves what is the physical meaning of this map mm. right we are saying it's a map between two spins but where are these two spins right so these two spins we can think of them as living on two ends of the edge mm. right and that's what the connection does it it takes a spin from one end one point in parallel transport it 
parallel transports it to another point. Yeah. Right? That's right. that's exactly what a connection does. Yes. So we can take each edge, right? And we can associate a spin J particle with each end of each edge. Okay. Then the Hilbert space associated with a single edge will consist of copies of the same edge, but with different J's on the on the ends. Right? Okay. Now, so this is a single edge, okay? Okay, this is for one edge. Now, what happens if you have multiple edges? Right? Because you want to probe some sort of geometry on an extended, you know, you, you don't want to just probe it along a one-dimensional curve, right? So you, you take n such edges, okay? Mm -hmm. And even though we are calling it a graph right now, at this point, we have not connected those edges together in any way, mm -hmm. okay? So this total Hilbert space- This right, edge this is- Hilbert, the edges are the curves of the holonomies, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, just to clarify, okay. So you have sprinkled your manifold with n such curves. Yes. With each curve, you have this Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. And with the collection of curves, you have this tensor product space. Okay. Okay. So now, um now what we can do is uh, now we can ask the following question right mm. what happens if you have some, these edges right and and um uh, they they are they are coming into a given region of space right you imagine four edges are coming into a given region of space mm -hmm. Right? Like a ball. Okay? So, you can think of that ball as a vertex of a graph. Right? So, now I'm going to switch back to my to my this thing so that I can draw what I'm talking about. Okay, so so we have these edges with each edge. We have L square G, L square mm -hmm. G, and so on. Okay, and mm -hmm. <laughs> each one of these L square Gs can be thought of as Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a it's a fox space, right? It's a fox space of of angular momentum. Okay. Now, now all of these edges are sort of disconnected, but consider what happens if, let's say, you have. four of these edges, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. Right? Which are all in some bounded region of this manifold, mm. right? So they're all neighbors of each other. Okay. And so we will, let's call this a vertex. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, of course, the thing is, the thing about this, this, uh, this way of constructing states is that the state space seems very uncontrollable mm. because 
there is an uncountable infinity of possible graphs and an uncountable infinity of possible ways in which you can sprinkle edges on a manifold, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems much, much too wild. But we can understand its structure by narrowing our attention down to uh, just a few of these, right? And then we will see that everything else can be built up from this. Okay, so this is uh, this is this is our vertex. Okay, mm -hmm. now uh, what is happening at this vertex? Remember that each one of these edges is carrying a spin. So this is carrying spin J one, J two, J three, and J four. Let's say. Okay, and now we are working in the momentum representation. We are not working in the holonomy representation. We are working in the momentum representation. Okay. Right. What that means is is that we started off with four edges which are correspond to four Holonomies, right? Mm. And then we have done this Fourier decomposition of these functions, right? Mm. And this Fourier decomposition, we are just looking at a single sector which co which corresponds to the spin J one on first edge, spin J two on the second edge, and so on. Okay, <laughs> so now uh, the uh, the question that that you know one can ask is, uh, what is happening at this vertex, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay, so now at this point, it's helpful to go back and look at the operator representation of our of our phase space variables right and so let's look at our, what our phase space variables were once again the phase space variables were uh, holonomies and fluxes holonomies and fluxes that's right yeah. so uh Right. So now, uh, you know, once again, you know, what is the action of um, this operator, the holonomy operator, let's say, on on a on a cylindrical state and a cylindrical state, if you will remember is a state mm -hmm. defined on on n edges mm -hmm. and they all correspond the a is the same because a is the same bulk, bulk connection in the whole manifold okay okay yeah so now uh, right so this this will be uh, we can associate this with some other edge let's say this will be something of this form right delta e e1 uh, delta something like this, i is equal to one to n, right? Basically, only if this edge is mm. lies on top of one of these edges, you will get a non-zero action. Otherwise, you'll get a zero, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? So. Uh, Something like this, right? And if none of if this edge doesn't lie on on any of these edges on which this function has support, then you get zero. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so now we can ask: Well, what is the 
uh, how do we define the action of 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 our uh, derivative flux. operator? Let's right. So uh, rather than asking, uh, rather than writing something like this, mm. what we are going to do is we are going to ask what is this operator. And what did I use for the connection? Let me go back to that a little bit. You use A. Omega, Omega. Oh, you. Oh, oh, oh well, you're using yeah, Omega. Yeah. yeah, I should. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's hard to be consistent when I'm trying to. So you use okay. connection for, you use Omega for the Ashtekar connection, which is spin connection plus curvature. Yeah. Okay, it's the, I, right. I'm yeah, used okay. to the opposite. I'm used to omega being spin connection, and then well, a I can call, being I can... spin connection plus curvature. But it's fine. I, it's fine. It's fine. I can call. I can call it. No, it's, it's fine. fine. It's fine. I can. I can follow along. Okay. So now, uh, you know what we're going to do is we're going to ask for this, right? The derivative with respect to the connection. Connection. Okay. What mm. is this object going to be? And now, um, without going into technicalities, okay, I'll tell you what this this object is. Mm. Remember, A is a spatial index and I is a group index. Yes. So we'll take some vector, normal vector, unit vector n. Okay, and we'll ask what is this object, okay? Uh, that's the A on the end should be downstairs. Not that it makes a difference because it's Euclidean, but anyway. Yeah. So uh, we can ask what is the action of this on our cylindrical state or uh -huh. cylindrical function? And this turns out to be, uh, let me see if I can give you a, uh, yeah, I, I can give you a, a, a derivation of this. So I'll, I'll give that to you in one second. Mm -hmm. This turns out to be equal to uh, J of I, where J is the, uh, basically the angular momentum, the i component of the angular momentum okay. acting on the state, acting on the state. All right, now, and let me, uh, explain how this comes about. So this state, this functional, right? It's a, it's a functional of these these holonomies, right? Okay, mm -hmm. and so we have, if we take this derivative. And we ask, what is the action of this on this psi, right? This will give you zero. Um, so unless, so so one has to, okay, so there are a couple of, uh, one has to regularize this in some way, which I'm not doing properly. But basically, this will this will boil down to the being able to calculate the derivative of a single holonomy, mm. right? I mean, this is basically what uh, what do you call it? Um, calculus. <laughs> yeah. Right. If 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 you take d d by dx of f of g, g of, of x, x. Mm -hmm. right? You can either write d of g, d of g, like this. Yes. It's so you the, do it's, kind of it's the do, same uh, thing. You do the functional yeah. chain rule. Right, functional chain rule, right. And now this holonomy, let's write down again the expression, is the path integral exponential from one point to another of oh, the tangent vector along the path uh, and the connection 
and then the generators the generator of the group okay mm -hmm. and we know how to take the the derivative of this polynomial right i mean this is something that people have used for a long time i think since people looked at gauge theories right so what is this going to be well it's just going to pull down this copy of n it's going to pull that down and it's going to pull down a co generator. copy of the copy of the generator right so this is going to be n a and, uh, y. and I should put an X here also, and a X, and then right tau I times H. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Right. And what are these tau I's, right? These tau I's are basically the matrices which They're... act on the they are minus i over two times the angular momentum operators right okay so ignoring the minus i by two like i mean you know it's this so again yeah please forgive me forgive me for all my uh slip ups mathematical slip ups uh right so maybe i'll just put proportional okay mm -hmm. So once you have this, uh, then then it we can uh, we can uh, construct. Uh, we can write down, for instance, uh, the derivative the with respect to connection of the with re psi of the action. Pages. Right, the connection, the action of the uh, sorry, the action of the operator corresponding to the uh, yeah again I'm being sloppy with the indices but right and what is this going to be this is well, I, you know, multiply this by this n a. We put a minus i n a, and it's equal to minus i n a n a j i. Like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, you know, I will admit that there, there are people, for instance, uh, you know, in the string community, like Jacques Distler and others, who have argued that well, you can't do quantization in this way. That that. Mm all the problems that LQG supposedly has arise from, uh, you know, doing this quantization in this way, which is, which is wrong, which is, you know. It's wrong because we are, we have one set of variables, but we are defining the operators with respect to other sets of variables. Like we had autonomies and fluxes, but now we are dealing with mm -hmm. triads and connections again. No, no. So, 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 so the only mistakes here are mine, mm. right? Yeah. If you, if you want a more rigorous discussion, you can look up. You can look at lectures by Mushin Han, for instance, on YouTube, mm. right? And he gives a very, very or, or Simone Speciale. Uh, or Carlo Rovelli. Mm -hmm. In I think decreasing order of rigor. So and I come below that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So 
and uh, so yeah i mean this is all established at a level of you know rigor that is accepted in mathematical physics no i i'm not questioning yeah. the rigor what i'm asking yeah. is if uh, the problem they are the string theorists are talking about is mm -hmm. that we we have one set of variables but now we are doing the operators with respect to the other set of variables which no, we no. So, so earlier no no we are not we are not no no we are not taking up something we have abandoned using this we can uh, we can write down the operator for the for these fluxes mm -hmm. right what is it, what are these fluxes these fluxes are these well okay so i these are these wedge products of these 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 tetrads right the triads yes yeah, right and a uh, triad yes and so now we can write down the operators for for this object mm -hmm. right and this operator corresponds precisely to the area of the surface yes right so this is well defined geometrically and 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 we are not you know abandoning anything we are just constructing these first so that we can construct the the flux operators the the mm -hmm. you know the construct the action of these uh, triad operators is easier to understand. I mean, because the flux operators are constructed from these triad operators, right? Right. Okay. So now uh, we have this. Okay. And uh, so finally, we are left with. So we. I haven't quite finished the description of these spin network states yet, uh, right? And the reason for that is because um, uh, I needed this, I needed, I needed this expression to mm -hmm. show you that the action of this, of this tetrad, uh, triad operator gives you this angular momentum. Yes. Okay, and now we'll see why we need that. Uh, So again, let me, yeah, yeah. Okay. right. So let me go back to the Gauss constraint. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what is the Gauss constraint? The Gauss constraint is the following. Okay. Yes. And there, there, there's a there's a tilde because the these if they are the densitized triads. Right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can right integrate this. And you can use the non-abelian Stokes theorem, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, integrate this over uh, some surface. So. Uh, no, sorry, the divergence, you integrate over some volume, right? Integrate this mm -hmm. over some volume. And then you can write it as a normal vector, the surface, the surface, the yes. surface integral, right? And so this is zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now the thing is that we can ask Oh, that's why it's zero. So the, huh? Oh, that's why it's zero. What? What? What is zero? Why? The the gauge constraints because of the the Stokes theorem as you as you just did. Then yeah. you have uh, then you have yeah. the triads contracted with the normal vector. That's why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And we can ask like what what this is this is a classical expression right so we can ask what is the operator equivalent of this mm. right what is the operator equivalent of this well the operator equivalent of this is basically saying that you have some closed surface and what what do these uh, triads the operator triads 
correspond to they correspond to the angular momenta well either going into the surface or coming out of the surface mm -hmm. right oh interesting right mm -hmm. and now we have gone from this in in doing this of course we have gone from taking this integral and uh replacing this integral by a sum over over this so you have some graph and now you take your surface and you ask where does it puncture this surface mm -hmm. and every place it punctures there is some angular momentum that is either coming in or going out mm. right Mm -hmm. And so the operator equivalent of this, when you act on a graph state, the operator equivalent of the of the Gauss constraint. We're almost doing a Feynman diagram with angular momentum instead of linear momentum, right? Yeah, but now you're jumping uh, several years ahead of uh, where we are in the discussion. I mean, this is why I've written a... <laughs> This this is why I've written a paper, uh, which is titled uh, "You know, scattering of elementary particles and intertwiners." So, I see. Because because we we'll, I haven't told you what intertwiners are, but intertwiners are basically a way of adding these angular momenta together. They are the vertex mm. degrees of freedom. And so this translates to the statement that sum of j i is zero. Mm -hmm. where this GI are the sum of the angular momenta coming into the into that region or into that vertex. And like you said, this is exactly like, like doing Feynman diagrams only with angular momenta instead of instead of uh, linear momentum. Instead of linear momentum. And that's that's what I've I have shown. A, you know, in this paper last year, is precisely this that mm. uh, that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the kinematic space of scattering of elementary particles and uh, these objects, which are called coherent inter intertwiners. Anyways, I don't want to go into too much detail, so. So, so this is this is how you know we we do quantization, mm -hmm. and this is what our state space now looks like. It it looks like this. There are these graphs, which are now connected, which can be connected. They can have disconnected components. Mm. They can have you know. Can be some they can whatever. they can loop on those on themselves. They can loop on themselves exactly. Uh, they can they can braid around each other like this, mm -hmm. right? All of these. So this is our state space, and and this is what. And each of these edges is now labeled by an angular momentum variable, mm -hmm. not by a holonomy. Okay. Right, so we are working in this momentum representation because that's what the how you get the angular momentum, right? You mm -hmm. use the Peter Weil theorem, which is going from the position space to the momentum space. You do the, the Fourier, the equivalent of the Fourier transform. Exactly, and then there is another set of objects which are living on these vertices, which is also a a true degree of freedom. And these objects are called intertwiners. Mm. And the reason they are present is because you have to, if you enforce this Gauss constraint, you need some object which you can contract again. Uh, I will, I'll probably will definitely have to do a part two of this video. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'll show you how this object comes about. So this is what a spin network state is. Mm -hmm. 
and now you know one can ask well what is the relationship of all of this to strings right so for let's say the nambu goto action right it's something like this where you are integrating over some two dimensional surface right mm -hmm. and now in using a spin network state right if i take take a surface this is my surface s2 and i take some spin network state okay and i probe this surface with this spin network state mm. like this okay and then there are all possible other connections and all which i am not worrying about right now then one can show and it's actually very straightforward to show that this square root of this determinant right this is an operator which you can write in terms of our our triads in fact i can give you the expression now and then maybe in the second part we'll talk more about uh, the square root of determinants of metric is just the determinants of triad yeah i mean because Diet on this case is, because it's two dimensional. Yeah, so you 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 take a you pick a basis like this, uh, which is uh, there is one component which is orthogonal, and two components which lie on the surface. In the, on the yeah on the surface or locally on the surface, and then this. Uh, so let me, I, I'll write down the expression explicitly. You can uh, read this, find this expression in uh, section 6.1 of my LQG for the bewildered uh, paper, which I wrote uh, with my colleague, uh, Sundan Spilson Thompson. And the thing is that I have never found a very simple or straightforward description of this area operator, even though it's not something very difficult. And maybe that's why nobody's really bothered to spell it out because, you know, smart people just get things, but I don't. And so I wrote this paper for people who are not too smart like me. And so we can write it like this. EXI, EXJ. Right, Delta IJ. And then if you take the determinant, just and and then if you take the determinant of this, right? Mm -hmm. So the determinant. Uh, will just be uh, this thing h11 h22 minus h12 um, per squared right and if you if you ask if you compare this for instance to the uh, to the to the Nambu Goto action, right? In the Nambu Goto action, you have this, right? D two x root h, right? Negative and what h is this? Technically, hmm? uh, negative right, okay, h technically. Yeah. Right, negative h because you know if you are because it's but a, again, it's a time like surface. Right. So again, just working with a Euclidean surface, and we'll come back to the consideration of time like surfaces in the next part. Okay. So what is this? This is uh, 
eta mu nu Well, if you are in Euclidean, then it's not say eta mu nu, it's just a delta, right? Yeah, sorry. So, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then what does this, what does this determinant uh, look like, this determinant here in terms of these h's? Well, it becomes x dot uh, times x prime. Mm -hmm squared minus x dot squared x, x prime, prime squared. squared. Yes. Now, if you compare this to the expressions that we have here, mm -hmm. right? In terms of the this Beerbein formulaism, then this is what this is e x i e x right e -X because you you are basically multiplying these right mm -hmm. e x i e x j uh -huh. so let me be careful about this and uh Mm. Yeah, multiplied by delta ij and then ey k eyl times delta k. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to be a little bit careful about this because this delta about function is being uses. contracted se yes. separately with, with all of them. So, right. And so let me again check and <laughs> make sure I'm not saying something ridiculous. Uh... Right. So this you can think of as x dot squared. You forgot you the, the of, off diagonal term. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm, I'm coming to that. Okay. So the, oh, okay. You you were just okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to, you know, get my thing. Uh, right. And mm -hmm. what is this? This is x dot dotted with x prime squared. Yes. And there you go. There you have the correspondence. Uh, so you can, uh, you have these embedding coordinates, embedding fields, right? And uh, uh, associated... The... The signature switch between the expressions. Yeah, I mean, modulo all the signature switches and modulo all the i's and the j's and everything else. Okay. Uh, okay, I mean, it's like James James Bond has a license to kill. I have a license to kill notation. Okay. Okay. So so we can identify this. Uh, exi, exj, delta ij, and if we can identify it with, let's say, uh, this x dot squared and second, and uh, let me just get that right, mm -hmm. dx by d tau squared, and then we can identify this. Uh, sorry. Right. So, so this exi maps to something like uh, ex the tau, uh, the tau, and eyi maps. Let's call it to something like. 
the axis sigma. There we go. There you have it. And uh, I'll just second. Try to make it a little bit more precise. E A B. Um, maybe no, let's see. D X A. D X B. Yeah, something like this. And then there are some indices that are missing, which have to be taken care of, but otherwise the structure is the same. Mm -hmm. Right? You have to keep to take over the I index, right? Because that's X should have an index also. Yeah, the X has an index. And so how does that fit into everything? Uh, so how should that fit into everything? So should that should should this index be on the x maybe? Maybe no, but this i and j are two dimensional, right? No, I mean these i's and j's they they uh, are inherited from the uh, internal the the local Minkowski space or the local flat space of the bulk. Oh, so so they are bulk indices, okay. They're bulk indices, right? And uh, so bulk Lie algebra valued indices. Mm -hmm. When you restrict them to to a two dimensional surface, you know you you you'll get a reduction in the effective effective dimensionality. But mm, so interesting then. So the two dimensional right? metric. You have the diodes with the spatial in the space time index is two dimensional, but yeah. with group group grouping this index being d dimensional. Yeah. I, I mean we can uh, figure out the detail. We we can figure out all the details, right? We can fill them in. But I mean, if you just look at this, okay. You just look at this. This is it. This is the correspondence between string theory and loop quantum gravity. <laughs> I see. I see. And uh, this is the part which I didn't have uh, in my first paper from 2017. Mm. So uh, yeah, of course we have to think about how these I and J indices, how they, what happens to them exactly, where they come from, and all of that. But you can see otherwise that the structure is the same, right? The structure mm -hmm. is the same, mm -hmm. and uh, so and when you take the derivatives of these embedding of these uh, of these embedding coordinate or embedding fields, that derivative gives you the tangent vectors to your surface, right? Yes. And then you are taking those tangent vectors and you are contracting them mm -hmm. to give you your metric rate. So how how are you how are you getting this metric right h h a b right you're getting them by contracting these these tangent vectors that's what that's what these objects are mm -hmm. so we can write this as e a mu and we can write this as e b mu mm -hmm. right yes when you think of this from a bulk perspective these are uh, these are these are two components of like a wear bind or a n bind right? mm -hmm. uh, and but in the when restricted to the surface they are uh, tangent vectors to the surface locally mm -hmm. yeah right and so if you uh, right and this is exactly how the metric is also written in terms of tetrads, right? You do the same thing, no? Yep. Just slightly different lettering. Mm -hmm. So this this correspondence works. I mean, I think it works. Yep. Right? And uh, so maybe, maybe we need to uh, look at our action again. And uh, 
Yeah, so the Re group indices are, are, are capital indices. Right. No, because in the action, we have kept the uh, the tetrads. Uh, we have not identified the tetrads with the embedding fields. Yes. We have to, we are treating them as separate objects, right? Right. So maybe maybe we shouldn't treat them as separate objects. But anyways. Uh, yeah, you are I mean, right. Because, because after all, the derivative of the embedding fields appear. Right. So yeah, this, uh, this brings complications to the to to when we promote the embedding fields to have yeah. an extra index. This will will have some yeah. complications. Yeah. So so maybe what we have written down so far, as far as that action is concerned, is not not right, and maybe we have to go back and examine it again. Yeah. Uh, or maybe not because. That action that we have written down is the Polyakov version. And in the Polyakov version, the internal metric is not the same as the uh, pullback of the bulk metric. Mm. Remember that? Actually, no, I haven't uh, studied much of the Polyakov action yet. So in the Polyakov action reduces to the Namugoto action, right? Yes. When you do the solve one of the equations of motion, and then you find that you you get exactly this this expression, I think. Yes, you you get back the number go to action if you you you, you get this expression and then you substitute that and you get the number go to action. Yes. Something like that. So, yeah. So maybe maybe we are on on the right track after all. But. This is so. Any questions, Luigi, at this point? Um, can you just refresh me on what is the path order exponential? Ah, the loosely, path order exponential. I loosely know what it is, but I didn't yes, catch yes, the details. Yes, yes. No, 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 no. Of course, of course, of course. Where is it? Uh, I have it here in my. I am sure I have it in second appendices of my yeah, there we go. So let me share this screen. Okay, so this is uh again my 2014 paper. Uh right, mm. and you can see it all of this is in the so so we we made a delib deliberate effect, uh deliberate uh, effort to put all the prerequisites, uh, you know, which mm -hmm. uh, people don't necessarily have. So, so the path order exponential is also one of them. And uh, so what is this path order exponential? Well, it's, it's this object. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you look at Sean Carroll's notes, I think he explains it. He explains it really well. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me let me just open those one second really quickly, and uh, yeah. And what was the page number seventy six? Okay, so you can see this. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, let's see. Right. So he's basically talking about uh, the the geodesic equation. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe it's a little bit. I think it might be a little bit earlier. Let me just go back. Yeah. There we go. So this is the, uh, so it arises whenever you consider something like the geodesic equation. Mm. Or um, in, 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 in quantum mechanics, this is called the, uh, the Dyson and somebody else, I forget, equation, which is, uh, 
so you are, you are solving for an expression. So this is your tangent vector, mm -hmm. v mu, right? And then you're taking its its derivative of this tangent vector. And so this is the geodesic equation, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And so how how do you solve it? Well, uh, the solution of this will boil down to an expression of this form, right? Where p is your propagator. Mm -hmm. Right. And what is this right. this uh, this propagator? Well, it comes from solving that equation that we were just looking at. Uh huh. And so we can write down a differential uh, equation for this. Uh huh. For this propagator, right? So we define this quantity. This quantity is taken from the geodesic equation, right? Let's go uh -huh. back here. This quantity yes. is this matrix. Yes. Right. This quantity is this matrix. So if you take the time derivative, the sorry, the the derivative of both sides of these expressions, mm -hmm. right? You will get you will get exactly this equation, mm -hmm. and then you substitute this, and you find that the propagator obeys this kind of an expression. Mm -hmm. And this pro and this propagator. Uh, so what is it saying? It's saying that the propagator for going from lambda not to lambda. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now we integrate this, right? And we get a constant and we get this integral, right? From lambda not to lambda. Mm -hmm. But now uh, the right side again depends on the propagator. Mm -hmm. Right? So this you have the propagator on the left and the propagator on the right in the integral, right? So your substitute so, sounds keep iterating. You iterate exactly, and that iterate this iteration. So the first step will now look like this. This is mm -hmm. delta. This is this. This is this. But now, when you do this integral, you have to be careful about the way you do it. Right? Mm. You can't just you can't just integrate from lambda not to lambda, lambda not to lambda. If you do that, you will be double counting. You'll be you know multiply counting the contribution. Mm. So instead, what you have to do is the Integral has to go from uh, the second the, for the second point, for instance, you're going from lambda naught to uh, your this is this 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 eta variable is there. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the eta prime variable, the eta prime variable goes from lambda naught to eta. Mm -hmm. And then the the eta variable goes from lambda naught to from... lambda. Yeah. So this is this is the path ordering, and you can understand this as an integral over a simplex. Mm. And uh, and the, the the reason we we say that this is this is path ordered is because if you if you look at this, if you look at this expression, the the second the inner integral corresponds to eta prime, right? Mm -hmm. So eta prime is always less than eta mm -hmm. because eta prime, the limits of integral are z, lambda naught to eta, right? Mm -hmm. And so in successive terms of this integral, what you will have is that if you look at the successive terms, in each of these terms, eta n will be greater than eta n minus one and so on. Mm. Right. So so this is this is your, it looks like this. Where lambda mm. naught goes to, so it's like you take lambda naught to lambda. These are the two ends of your curve, mm -hmm. and then you divide it divide it into uh, n parts. And the first integral goes over the lambda naught to the first data. Then the second integral goes over lambda naught to the second data, lambda mm -hmm. naught to the third data, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then you can write this as one by n factorial of this path ordering symbol. What is this path ordering symbol? It's now it's saying mm. that there is no restriction on, there is no ordering on these etas, mm -hmm. right? And that means you are integrating over the uh, entire hypercube. You are integrating over n n. So uh, instead of thing, this right. of this simplex, you now go over the cube. Okay. Cube, right? Lambda not to lambda, lambda not to lambda, like. Mm -hmm. 
so so in quantum field theory this is called this this is what we do this is called normal ordering right mm -hmm. no, normal ordering is when you take some collection of operators and then you rewrite them so that they act in a causal way from left to right mm -hmm. right that's called a normal ordering it's the same thing but yeah this is what the path ordered exponential is okay okay All right. So I hope that's uh, sufficient uh, for now. Yeah, it, so it's uh, it it helps a bit. It's a bit more clarifying than what I've seen up to now. Yeah. Uh, so shall I stop the recording, or do you have any more questions which might be no, relevant to? I think we can question. stop for now. All right. Okay. So uh, we'll see all of you. Uh, all the thousands of viewers on YouTube interested in quantum gravity and string theory in part two of this video. Bye-bye.